thank you for coming to this radio program. We just praise you for joining Freedom Through Faith. That's the whole purpose. When I started this ministry back 26, 27 years ago, whatever the case may be, 25 years ago, I had no idea Freedom Through Faith would be such a relevant name today. Amen. I mean, we started this ministry to proclaim our freedom through our faith. Amen. Glory to God. And that's where we are at today. It is so needful in the day and time in which we live. Praise God. We just thank you for joining us. Uh, let me go ahead and, and let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer as we get started today's broadcast. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for your blessings in our life. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for having us born in such a time as this. The things we see happening right now, Lord, all the prophets of old desired to see, but they couldn't see it because the time was not yet. But these are the days and times which you prophesied we would see just before your return. And Lord, we thank you that we are here, appointed by God to be born in this day and this hour for such a time as this. Praise God. Lord, have your way with this broadcast. May the words spoken be your words. May they go through for throughout the world through the power of the internet touching someone's heart and changing their life and their destiny forever and we pray this in jesus name amen and amen glory to god join me in our profession of faith commonly referred to as the apostles creed say these words out loud we lay this as the solid foundation upon which we will build amen glory to god just repeat after me i believe in god the father almighty maker heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Oh, but the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended up into heaven and is seated right now at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall return soon. To judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life, life everlasting in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me get this Facebook Live started here. Hallelujah. We want to proclaim this message far and wide. Amen. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn. So where should we start, Lord? Turn with me to Matthew. We're going to start off in the book of Matthew. We're not going to stay there long, but I just wanted to, to talk about this part first. Amen. And Matthew chapter... Uh, I believe it's, let's see. Oh, Lord have mercy. Is it Matthew? Yeah. Chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I want to go to Matthew chapter 12. I'm still firing up Facebook Live here. And uh, I want to read to you a little bit down about verse, we'll start in verse 39. Amen. Let me go ahead and welcome everybody here to Facebook Live for us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The technology is great. We could preach to the whole world. Amen. This God is so good with what he has put together for us. And, and to be able to proclaim this message to you today is the, the Lord is just so awesome. Hallelujah. Hello, everybody out there on Facebook Live. We're so glad you're joining us today. Today's message, by the way, is titled, entitled, America, Love It or Kill It. Oh, wow, that's a pretty bold statement there, brother. But you're going to catch the gist of it as we go through today's teaching. Now, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. We'll begin 
verse, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. There will be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they did not repent at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Now, since Jesus here was talking about Jonah, let's go to the sign of Jonah. Turn with me to the book of Jonah. And that's where we're going to be preaching from initially. Uh, we're not going to stay there long, praise the Lord, but we will, we'll, this is what we're going to be talking about. Jonah chapter one. Now, in case you're having a hard time finding Jonah, it's right after Obadiah. Yeah, I know. Where's Obadiah? Okay. Find Ezekiel, Joel, and all that. They're the minor prophets. If you have to use your table of contents, that's okay. That's what they're there for. But let's start reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amity, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against us. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The wickedness of Nineveh had ascended to heaven, where God now had to take some action. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach what the Lord had told him to preach because nobody would listen. He said, you know, this place is so wicked, I'll go over there, they'll kill me. No, I don't want to go. So he abdicated his assignment. He said, I'm not going. You can't make me go. And he went the other way. He got in the boat and was headed in the opposite direction. And I'm going to summarize the story because I, I need to get over to uh, the, the gist of the matter. And that is, God said, you will go. You will say this. You don't have a choice in the matter. And Jonah ended up being swallowed by a fish. So that God could remember it, the boat's going in the opposite direction. God turned that fish around, headed him back the way he was supposed to go, and spit him out on the ground and said, Now get up and go. And Jonah's like, Okay, yeah, I'll go. And when he <laughs> go Jonah chapter two, actually, uh, Jonah chapter three, after that happened. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, said, now get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, preach to it what I tell you to preach. So Jonah decided, yeah, it might be in my best interest to go. And he entered. He's, he, 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 to walk across Nineveh would take three days. And he went a whole day's journey, in other words, into the center of the town. And the word of the Lord was, in 40 days, Nineveh, this great city shall be overthrown. That's the message. Folks, we're just, at the time of this broadcast, we're just over 40 days from the next election, presidential election, Senate elections, House of Representative elections in the United States of America. The wickedness of this nation has come up before God. I'm not saying I'm a prophet Jonah. However, the book of Jonah does hold a very special place in my ministry. Because when God called me to preach, I was like, you got the wrong guy. Uh, no, I am not going. My calling is Ezekiel chapter 2, chapter 3. In case you were wondering what that says, uh, I'll summarize it for you. I'll put my words in your mouth. You'll speak them. Nobody will want to hear them. I'm calling you to a people of your own nation. They won't want to listen to you. But that's okay. I made your head harder than their heads. And I've been called a hard head my whole life. That made complete sense to me. But I was, no, no, I do not want to be a preacher. Nope, 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 nope. And then when I fought it, I got to the book of Jonah, and I was reading my daily Bible study, and I'm reading the book of Jonah, 
And God said, do I need to do something like this with you? And I said, no, sir, I'll do it. And that's when I accepted my calling to be a preacher. Now, here in chapter 3, Nineveh, wicked, wicked, wicked. Jonah's like, they're not going to listen, but I'll go say it anyway. And he did. He said, in 40 days, your end shall go, unless you repent. And the people of Nineveh believed what Jonah said. They believed God and proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest, the king, all the way down to the least of them. For the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, laid his robe aside, covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Cry mightily unto God, and let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we do not perish? And God saw their works, verse 10. And they turned from their evil way. And God repented, not repented like, oh, I'm sorry I had to do that. No, it, 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 he turned from the evil that he said he was going to do unto them and did not do it. Folks, we are at that point in the United States of America right now that God has sent his warning. We see it in all these things happening all over this land simultaneously right now. You know, we've covered before in the book of Revelation that, you know, all these things have to come to pass in the last days. And when they, the disciples asked Jesus, what's a sign of your coming when all these things are going to happen? He said, number one, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. He goes, and when you see all these things begin to happen simultaneously, that is not the end. That's just the birth pain of what's about to come. We are experiencing the birth pains right now. We've been experiencing them for a couple of years now, a generation, problem after problem. First is here, and then an earthquake here, and a fire here, and riots here, and, and all these things happening sporadically. What happens as a woman's about to give birth? First is a pain here. You call your doctor. I'm having birth pain. Okay, how far apart? Oh, 15, 20 minutes. All right, don't worry about it. Call me when they get closer. And you call back 10 minutes. Okay, you're getting there, you know. Uh, they're about seven minutes. Apart. Okay, you can come on into the hospital now. You know, three minutes, two minutes, one minute. And as it gets closer and closer and these things are happening more, the crowning of the baby takes place. Birth is about to happen. That, the problems we are going through are not calamities meant to destroy the world. It's we are giving birth to a new kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord. That's what's happening in the earth right now. This earth is about to give birth to a new kingdom, one that has been proclaimed since the foundation of the world. The natural world is going to dissolve and go away, and the new earth is going to be formed. Read the end of the book, praise God. But what's happening right now? is the prelude to the bigger judgment. And the prophets of God have been proclaiming this day that if you don't repent, even worse things are about to happen. When uh, Elijah went into the king and told him, you know, get your affairs in order, you're about to die. And he turned around and walked out. The king turned his face towards the temple. And pray, says he turned towards the wall where his bedroom was situated that was actually facing the temple and prayed. And as Elijah's walking out through the, the courtyard, God spoke to him again and said, okay, turn around, go back, tell him I heard his prayer. I'm going to give him another 15 years. He was still going to die. But God honored his prayer because he repented. And God gave him another 15 years. Is it possible for the United States to get another 15 years of blessings? Yes. How? By repenting. Repenting of the sins of this nation, the sins of the past two generations. And not just the past generation, 
the past two generations. We're talking 50, 60 years, even before that. You know, America has turned from the foundation of this nation, loving and honoring and obeying God and his word, loving his precepts, loving one another. We've turned from that to hating God, hating God's word, hating anything that limits the people's desire to love themselves more than they love one another. We fail to take care of others in society. I, I'm just going to hold on for you some of the, the, the things that are going on in this nation right now today. You know, we fail to take care of others in society who can't take care of themselves. Homelessness and hunger not only still exists, despite all the social programs that have been enacted by the federal government and state governments to take care of the homeless, to feed the hungry. It used to be the responsibility of the church. And there wasn't that much homelessness. There wasn't that much hunger because the church was fulfilling its God-given obligation. But the government stepped in and said, oh, you don't need to do that. We'll take care of it. We'll just raise some taxes and we'll take care of it. Every time they create another bureaucracy, they have to have the system in place to support it. So they might say, we're going to put a billion dollars toward it. But in the end, only about 200 million, about 20% actually goes to the actual stuff on the ground. The rest is the bureaucracy. That's what the Democrats want, bigger government. But not only do we have war veterans that are homeless and can't get the care they need. But one political party in particular wants to give free health care to those who are here illegally and ignore the rest. You know, many Americans, claim, they claim to be born again. But are they really? Jesus said you would know the tree by its fruit. Matter of fact, we'll turn over there now. Turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus here on the Sermon on the Mount. So verse 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, proclaiming to be Christians, proclaiming to, to be wanting to help you and do all these nice things, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Well, there's a description of the Democrat Party. It's right there. Think about it. Think about it. They proclaim to be there to help. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves. They said, you'll know them by their fruit. You will know them by what they produce. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree brings forth Corrupt fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only he that does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Aren't we a Christian country? In your name, we've done all these wonderful works. We've even cast out devils and, and done all these. And I will profess to them, I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, in other words, not just talk about them, but actually does them. I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock, and then he goes into that. The point I want you to see is Jesus himself says, know the, fruit, true, know the tree by its fruit. Because a good tree cannot, not will not, cannot bring forth good fruit. A bad tree. A corrupt tree cannot, not will not, cannot bring forth good fruit. If it's corrupt, no matter how hard they try, the fruit's going to be bad. So 
we understand you have to know the tree by its fruit. You have to know the politicians by what they are producing. A corrupt tree may appear to be flowering and preparing to bring forth fruit, but the fruit it bears is as corrupt as the tree itself. Have you ever picked an apple off an old, unhealthy apple tree? I have. Growing up in Michigan, there are some wild apple trees out in the woods. And sometimes you'll be walking along and you'll come across one of these wild apple trees. The apples you see on them are not like what you see in stores. I can guarantee you that. Apples from these wild trees are small, almost golf ball size, maybe the size of a tennis ball. And they do not like they would even be good to eat. I mean, the, the skin, the outer skin is, is marred. And, I mean, it, it, they look bad, okay? And if you cut one open, but, you know, if, you, <laughs> growing up there, you learn. If, you know, you're hungry and you, you find one of these apples out in the woods, apple trees out in the woods, before you bite into it, take your knife and cut it open, okay? So first, you want to peel off that nasty skin. Second, you want to see if the fruit is good. Because when you cut it open, there, there's sometimes there's worms inside. You can't tell from the outside because they enter through the little flowery part on the bottom. And if there are no worms and you decide to eat it, usually, probably 90% of the time, it tastes terrible. It's just super bitter, and it tastes terrible. And if you eat, I mean, if, you, if it's a survival situation, yeah, you can eat it. But if you eat too many of them, at one time, you're going to get an upset stomach, seriously upset stomach. And you may get a good apple every now and then. It is sweet. But for the most part, the fruit is absolutely terrible. Well, that is what happens to so-called Christian Americans that say they are born again, but they have no fruit that is shared with the world. You know, they may display some fruit, say, well, here it is. See, I've done this. This is what I do. But their fruit is an appearance only. It's filled with worms, the worms of this world. And their fruit is bitter to the taste, especially when God is the one who's judging the fruit. Their fruit's all about themselves. With a pretense of trying to be fruit for others and for God, but in reality, it's just the tree trying to reproduce after its own kind. That's all fruit is. You, you do realize that, right? Fruit, when a tree produces fruit, it is not, say, here, let me give you something to eat. The tree is trying to reproduce after its own kind. That's what the seeds are for. The, the, when the apple falls to the ground, it contains the seeds to reproduce the tree. And animals will come, pick it up, take it away to another location, eat it, consume it, and the seeds fall into the ground. Think about this. You can count the seeds that are in one apple, but you cannot count the apples that are in one seed. Because when that seed's planted into the ground, you know, out of all those apples that fall from a tree, maybe a thousand apples from a good tree, several hundred to be sure, maybe one or two of those apples will fall into a position where as it rots and that seed falls into the ground, it grows into a tree. So that's what the tree is trying to do is reproduce itself. And if the fruit is rotten, if the fruit is bitter, if the fruit is nasty, What's contained in the seed? Same thing, right? So it just reproduces another nasty, bitter replica of itself. And that's what we see has evolved in the United States. Why do you think all these problems are happening in the inner cities where godless people have been leading a godless life forcing godless policies on a population. And that's how they grew up. That's the way we've always voted. This is the way we've always lived. They, you know, they say if we keep voting for them, they're going to give us a better life. And you know, we keep waiting for it, but they keep promising it. And this, you know, this is what we do generation after generation. That's how we vote. And now 
that corrupt system has produced corrupt fruit, which is now reproducing after itself. You can see it. This kind of tree out in the wild is good for nothing to be cut down, not harvested. And that's what's going to happen at the judgment with this type of so-called Christians. You know, in this 24-7 culture and economy, nobody has an actual day of rest anymore. You know, I can remember growing up when everything shut down on Sundays. Gas stations, stores, convenience stores, all of them were closed on Sunday. Liquor stores were closed on Sunday. You couldn't even buy beer on Sunday. This was so people could go to church. Grocery stores would open like at noon or one o'clock. That was about it. 90% of church parking lots were full on Sunday mornings. Not anymore. People still go to work today. They go out and, and you know, do barbecues and, and sporting events and go shopping. You know, stores are open. Liquor stores are open. Malls are open. Churches are closed or barely attended. You know, 90% of church parking lots may have some cars in the morning, but if they got 1,000 people in attendance Sunday morning, announce a prayer service that night or a one night during the week. You might get 20, 25, 30, 40 people if you're lucky. We as a nation have lost sight of God. We've lost our Sabbath day of rest. Work and serving our own pleasures have turned us away from serving God. We do not respect our elders anymore in this culture. We don't honor our fathers and mothers. We don't honor, cherish, and heed the advice of our, that our elders can provide. There was a time when having gray hair was considered a sign of wisdom. Today, gray hair is covered up with hair dye and wigs. Our senior citizens have lived a long life that was wrought with troubles, but they learned to overcome them. And their job is to pass along those tidbits and wisdom and knowledge to the younger generation. Today, the younger generation thinks their parents are, ah, they're just too old fashioned. You know, those old people, they don't have anything they can contribute to help us today. We do not honor those who came before us anymore. We do not, as a nation, pay tribute to those who came before us. You know, cancel culture is now the norm. If you don't like the history of the United States, instead of learning about what truly happened, learning the lessons, evaluate the outcomes, good or bad, then make decisions to not repeat those mistakes anymore, but take the successes and build an even better future. Instead of doing that, what does American society do today? They want to eliminate the history they don't agree with. They want to change it to fit their own narrative. They want to abolish any reference to any person whom they believe may have done something wrong to some person or group of people at some point several hundred years ago. Folks, slavery was wrong, flat out wrong. Slavery is wrong. Racism is wrong. But instead of trying to eliminate the discussion of slavery in America's past, why don't these activists today fight slavery? Where is happening at today? There's slavery today. Yeah, you don't hear about it on the news, do you? There are many nations where slavery is still in practice. Why don't these quote unquote woke people talk about these nations? Why don't they decide to go to those cities and countries and protest there? about what's happening over there right now. Instead, they want to burn down businesses here. They want to murder innocent people on the streets of America right now over something that happened 200 plus years ago. And since we're on this subject, let's talk about slavery for a minute. Let's talk about racism in America for a minute. Let's talk about how misinformed the black community, not entirely, but especially the younger generation is, about the truth of racism in America. You know, slavery came to this nation, mainly imported in the South. Those that were brought up North, the, the pilgrims and, and those up in the Northern area, they didn't want it. They wanted every person to be free and free to worship God in their own way. 
a different group of colonists settled down south. And these slaves were brought over to work on the farms and the plantations that came to be called. The northern colonies had some slavery, but for the most part, it was frowned upon and discouraged. The northern colonies believed freedom was for every person, regardless of the color of their skin. Again, not 100%. You can give examples where that didn't happen. But for the majority of the population, this was the case. And after the Revolutionary War had been won and the Republic was being formed, we needed a constitution. We needed every single state. At the time, it was 13 individual colonies. We needed them to come together in agreement to form a more perfect union. And slavery was one of the sticking points that threatened to keep this nation from actually being formed. Therefore, it was omitted. Any reference to it was omitted from the original Constitution. But the original Constitution didn't go far enough in providing for the federal government. There was you know, the inability to pay taxes or, and all that good stuff, or gather taxes. So uh, a few years later, it was agreed that we need to have another constitutional convention. Now, initially, it was just to come together and we'll try and work out how we're going to, you know, take care of this, uh, the federal government and all that. And then they decided we just need a new constitution. So the second constitutional convention was convened. And that is where we came up with now three branches of government, independent branches, that checks and balances were put in place. But a major sticking point was on the representation form of government. So they had to come up with a way to elect the House of Representatives. Now at this time, 10, now you think slavery was rampant back then, 10 of the 13 states at this time had already outlawed and banned slavery at the state level. Only three states maintained slavery and they threatened to destroy the, the Constitutional Convention aspect of it by walking out if the the 10 other states insisted slavery be abolished those three states were georgia north carolina and south carolina these states threatened to leave the convention if the other 10 wanted slavery banned but these southern states wanted their slaves to be counted in the population because that way they would receive more representatives in the government, in the House of Representatives. And that would give them more power to vote things favorable to their environment, which was slavery. But the North was saying, okay, well, for every person you count in your population, you owe this much in taxes. Well, the plantation owners and, and those in charge in the South, they didn't want to raise their taxes. They didn't want to pay the taxes on these black slaves. They just wanted them count so that they could, the white people could elect more of their representatives into Congress. So that was the sticking point. The North did not want the South to have a larger population count uh, unless they paid the taxes. So they reached this compromise. The agreement, now called the Three-Fifths Agreement, was the compromise. Now you see this being raised a lot in, uh, you know, uh, the african-american community you know i'm more than three-fifths of a man they think that is a slam towards the republicans in effect it should be a slam towards the democrats because they're the ones that wanted the, the to have them counted yes they wanted each one counted but they didn't want them counted as a person they wanted them to maintain to be property and they said we don't need to pay taxes on property see the the, the split here and how now the Democrats are twisting the narrative. What's happened is that the Northern states wanted to abolish slavery altogether. You abolish slavery, you can count them. And the South didn't want to do that. The Southern states' main desire was to keep slavery, increase their population count, increase their power in Washington. The Northern states' goal was to create the union and secure the government. And they feared antagonizing to the South to the point that they just leave the Union. Most Northern states saw slavery as a dying institution by this point in time. It was on the decline. That's why there's only three states that still had it. And they figured there's no economic future. Like I said, 10 states had already outlawed it. But then came along an invention called the cotton gin. And that increased the 
ability for the southern states to uh, increase their productivity. The plantation size grew, which means they needed more slaves, and it spread to more southern states. And the agreement at that second constitutional convention was we'll allow this now, but in about 50, 60 years, you know, we figure this is going to be done. We'll go ahead and at that time amend the constitution to outlaw completely. Well, with the invention of the cotton gin and the spread of slavery in the South, that didn't happen. That brought about the uh, advent of the Republican party and the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, who wrote, who ran for election on, we will free the slaves. We will set this up where the slaves will be free. Well, that just upset everybody in the South. Said, we told you we'd leave, we're leaving. And that started the first civil war. I say first civil war, not the civil war, because we are in the midst of a second civil war right now, the beginning stages of it right now. But that's a different topic for a different time. But let me, for those woke people out there, for those who are Democrat out there, for those who oppose everything that the Republicans say because they're a bunch of racists, I have some questions for you. And I want you to answer them truthfully. The questions I have for those of you who think Republicans are racist and Democrats are not, answer these questions truthfully. What group or political party opposed the banning of slavery? The Democrats. What group or political party went to war to keep slavery? The Democrats. What group or political party refused to end slavery even after losing the war? The Democrats. What group or political party enacted oppressive tactics to keep freed slaves on the plantations? The Democrats. What group or political party formed the KKK to intimidate blacks from exercising their freedoms? The Democrats. What group or political party elected KKK members to all levels of elected office in order to keep the black people suppressed? Again, the Democrats. What group or political party, seeing the Republicans pushing through this Civil Rights Act that is about to be forced on them, they decided to try and change that narrative in order to promise change if the black people would vote to keep them in power. What party did that? The Democrats. What group or political party has been promising since the mid-1960s to bring prosperity to the black race, but for the most part, has kept them in bondage in the inner cities? The Democrats. What group or political party has controlled most major metropolitan areas based on those promises where they were elected to power, promising prosperity to the populace, all in exchange for their votes since the mid-1960s? The Democrats. What group or political party has failed the black voters at every turn to improve their lives, improve the lives of black Americans, but continues to promise these elusive benefits, but they never happen? the Democrats. What group or political party realizes they failed the black people? So now they want to institute socialism as a promise of bringing income wealth distribution to America. The Democrats. What group or political party wants to shut down any form of individualism, any effort to make yourself better, any effort to lift yourself out of one economic condition and make life for yourself and your family better? The Democrats. What group or political party has spit in the face of God and refuses to even recognize him in the foundation of this nation? The Democrats. What group or political party wants to keep true Christians from sharing their faith outside the four walls of the church? The Democrats. What political party doesn't even have God in their political platform? The Democrats. What group or political party wants to continue to allow the murder of young children in the womb? The Democrats. What political party wants to allow adults to have sex with minors without any penalty or, or, or consequences? The Democrats. California. What group or political party wants to enforce the laws of the land, of the state, or the city 
and protect its citizen, uh, rephrase that, what political party refuses to enforce the laws of the land, the state, or the city and protect its citizens from violence, crime, and murder? Democrats. What group or political party wants to raise your taxes, take more of your hard-earned money, and line their pockets with it under the pretense of creating more social programs? The Democrats. What group or political party refuses to condemn anarchists, terrorists, and those who want to overthrow America and the freedoms we've enjoyed for more than 240 years? The Democrats. What group or political party violates the rights of the citizens of America on a continuous basis just because they disagree with the political views of someone who opposes their political views? The Democrats. With all of these questions, if you answer truthfully, I have one more question for you, maybe two. How can you believe God will not bring judgment on a nation that does all these things? How can you not believe that God will not bring judgment on this nation for turning our backs on him as a people, collectively? I mean, he has shown throughout the Bible that he will take action on a nation that he has deemed unredeemable. And from everything happening in America right now, and especially in Democrat-controlled cities, I might add, only a fool would say America is right in God's eyes. Far, far from it. Do you think it's a coincidence that all these wildfires broke out in California almost immediately after Governor Newsom signed legislation that allows adults to have sex with minor children? Do you think all these natural disasters are just happening all across America right now? Or maybe is it God's trying to get our attention? Do you think this Chinese virus just happened? Or was God allowing it to spread across the world in order to get our attention back on him and off of ourselves? I mean, think about it this way. We worship, here in the United States, we worship money idols. Many households have both parents working outside the home, often 60, 70 hours a week. And it seems like their finances are all tight. Why? Because they have too much debt. Why did they get into debt? Because they didn't want to save for what they wanted. We'll just pay for it now and get it, and make us happy, and then we'll pay a little bit over time later. That's what debt is. Two, three generations ago, it wasn't like that. I can remember when the, the first credit card was called a diner's card. Just so you go out to dinner. That was it, a diner's card. And, you know, you might go down to the store and work out a deal with the proprietor of the store to have credit in the store, you know, where I'll buy this today and I'll pay you over time. This was especially true back in, in the uh, farming, rural, com rural farming communities back turn of the century and the early part of the century where they go in, the, heart, the, the crops were in the field, but they still needed to live now in the spring and summer until harvest time. So the store proprietor would, you know, you buy what you need. Okay. That was this much money sign here next to your name. And he kept a running tab. And when the harvest came in, the farmer sold the grain, he'd come in and pay off the tab. But that's how the credit system started. Now teenagers are getting credit cards. Go spend it. Go on vacation. You know, the, College-age students, freshman year in college, getting credit cards so they can go on spring break and things like that. Folks, learning to live with debt has killed America, so much so that the elected government officials have just incurred debt after debt after debt after debt. National debt. Our national debt now exceeds our gross national product on an annual basis. That if it was your personal finances, and let's say you had uh, $5,000 a month income coming in, but you had $6,000 a month income going out, you are set up for bankruptcy. And that's where the United States is right now. Right now. The government is printing money like there's no tomorrow. Well, in one way, they're right. Because if they keep doing it, there will not be a tomorrow. But we worship money idols. 
We worship music idols. We worship sports idols. We worship movie stars, movie idols. We worship our own desires over God. We don't want to go to church because I want to go to the beach. We don't want to go to church. I want to sleep in. We don't want to go to church. I want to go to the football game. So what did this virus actually do for the past six months or so? Well, God shut down our jobs, taking away our money idols. Income shut off. What are you going to do now? God shut us up in our homes, forcing us to spend time with family, probably for the first time in a generation. God removed the music idols, shut down any concerts and concert venues. God shut down the sports idols, shutting down sporting events. God removed movie idols, shutting down Hollywood and theaters. God was <clears throat> giving us time to decide who and what we should be focusing on, him. Not us, not money, not sports, not movies, God. You may ask, well, why did God shut down churches then if it was so important? Oh, that's an easy answer. Something I've been preaching on for a few years now. Because some Christians were idolizing their pastors, these rock star pastors. Some of these mega churches where the services are more of a theatrical show than a teaching the word service. Some services are two hours or more long, and the teaching on the word only counts maybe 30 or 40 minutes of it. The rest is music and theater and dance. And, you know, the dark lights, dark stages with just the bright lights shine. It's like a theatrical production. Folks, we are running out of time. If you follow Bible prophecy at all, you can clearly see we are living in the days that have been foretold about in the Bible. And I'm not going to say it's going to happen this year, next year, even 10 years from now. I don't know. Jesus himself said, you don't know. He didn't know at that time. I'm sure he does now. But when he was on earth, God did not reveal that to him because God knew he'd tell, right? But he says, only God the Father knows. But he says, I went up to heaven. I will come back for you at the appointed time. Well, that time is about here. The end is about to come. Not, I'm not speaking gloom and doom. Oh, far be it. You know, some people that I talk to, they say, what, what, what are we going to do? Oh, what's going to happen? You know, the times are so bad. I say they're so bad because what's coming is so good. I am not worried about this world going to hell in a handbasket at all because the Bible says this has to happen. What I'm seeing happening right now is Bible prophecy about to take place that says Jesus is coming back. Praise God. Hallelujah. But I would be negligent if I did not share with you the story about Nineveh, where the people of Nineveh actually repented of their sins and they got salvation. They got a break from the destruction that was coming for another generation. Ultimately, they did turn against God. They forgot about what had happened. And they fell. They fell hard. We see in the Bible, instance after instance, where forgiveness is given. What did Jesus say? Go and sin no more. We can, just like he told the king, I'll give you 15 more years. We don't know if we'll get 15 years or another generation or another 100 years. One thing is sure. If we continue on the path right now, I don't want to preach doom and gloom, but for some of you, most of you, it will be. But for the true believers who are producing fruit for the kingdom, this should be a joyous time. This People are more receptive to the word of God than at any time in recent history because they understand something is about to happen. In their spirit, even if they're not born again, in their spirit, they sense something is about to happen. Why do you think all these demon-inspired people are in the streets rioting right now? Well, it's racism. No, it's not. That's the pretense. The demons know their time's about short. It's short. It's about up. And they are angry. They don't want Jesus to come back. They don't want Christians to proclaim Jesus is coming back. So these demons are jumping on people, 
possessing their bodies, influencing their decisions, making them run around like lunatics in the street, killing anybody and anything that opposes what they're saying. It's all about themselves. Not, you know, it's not about the truth. It's all about themselves. We are facing what is called preliminary judgments right now in America. God has put this nation in a position where the very future of this nation hangs on this election coming up at the time of this recording in 2020. Now, I'm not being overly dramatic. Just listen to me. All the hatred, vile things that the Democrats have unleashed, they used to do but would deny that they were doing it. Now they don't even deny their hatred for freedom, for God, for this nation anymore. They're actually proclaiming America is not the greatest nation on earth. They're proclaiming their disdain for America and our way of life. They're canceling our culture. They're destroying every fabric of our society. And these Democrats are asking you to vote for this and approve this. In a couple minutes I got left, let me just summarize Donald Trump's presidency for you in a nutshell. He was positioned by God for such a time as this. How else could he have overcome such odds stacked against him in the primary in 2016 and then to beat Queen Hillary? He's faced more opposition, not just from the Democrats, but his own party at every turn, yet he prevails. There's been almost no positive news coverage of Donald Trump since he won the nomination for the president back in 2016. None, but yet he prevails. He's faced more negative press coverage than any president before him, yet he prevails. He's done more for Christian America than just about any other president in the modern generation, though he's been fought against at every turn, yet he prevails. He's done more for the nation of Israel since 1948 than any other president since then and been fought for by the Democrats, but yet he prevails. He has faced lie after lie after lie being told about him, yet he prevails. He built the strongest economy this nation has ever seen in its history, despite the opposition, yet he prevails. There can only be one explanation. God is with him. Now, you may not like him. You may not like his style. You may not like his demeanor. You may not like his tweets. You may not like his background. You may, but you cannot deny God is with him. Now, we are witnesses of all these things happening in the United States right now. The virus, the shutdown, the economic downturn. Now it's being turned around, despite the Democrats' attempts to stop it before the election. The riots in the streets that the Democrats fail to address or even try and stop. All the natural disasters happening. All these things point to one thing and one thing only. This election will determine if the United States is allowed to continue to be the greatest nation on this planet. Or if we will fall like all other great nations before our time. In every one of those instances, the main reason was they forgot or did not recognize God. This nation used to be a missionary sending nation, taking the gospel all over the world. Now we are the nation other nations are sending missionaries to because we have forgotten God. And if all of this was not evident enough that this election will determine the future of America, now at the time of this recording, we had just learned that Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Donald Trump ran and was elected to fill the Supreme Court, the vacancies on the Supreme Court of the United States with Christian conservative justices. And he has been doing just that. If he could, it can't be more evident that Donald Trump was put in a position by God himself for such a time as this. And this must show you how important this election truly is. Donald Trump has an opportunity to finally, after almost half a century of liberalism and anti-godly values being forced on us by liberal justices on the Supreme Court, we finally have a chance to turn this nation back to a constitutionalist interpretive court. We finally could have at least five or a six Christian majority on the court. 
Oh, I thought you had five already. Well, I say five or six because the chief justice does not always vote along Christian lines. He's kind of in the middle on a lot of things, voting with liberal anti-godly policies on one part and then Christian values on another. But we need Donald Trump to appoint and get this next justice in there in order to help change the future of America. And with the re-election of Donald Trump, we could even end up with a seven to two Christian conservative majority, finally able to turn back some of the immoral laws being forced down the throats of God-loving Americans. But the point I want to leave you with is this. Just like the days of Noah, I'm proclaiming this over America. Repent or judgment will fall. And we as a nation, are we going to heed the warning? Nineveh did, and they were spared another generation. Are we going to spare the next generation? Or will this be the last generation that will actually enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Pray with me this prayer right now. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we repent of our national sins. We repent of our national sins that we've committed against heaven and against you and against your word. Forgive this nation, Lord, of its sins. Lord, we pray against the division in this land the demonic influences over this land. We pray for Donald Trump to be reelected as president of the United States. We pray for a veto-proof Christian conservative majority in both houses of Congress, Lord, that we can turn back the immorality, the lawlessness, the immoral policies that have been forced on this land. We pray for your blessing on the United States of America. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will shine your favor on this land again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Be blessed in all that you do.